Hey everybody, welcome to Challenged Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt. Our next guest, one of the legends of CAF, Mr. James Saad, joins us from his palatial estate. How are you doing, James? Good, how are you, Bob? Thanks for having me. Always, Always a pleasure. pleasure. Always uh, a pleasure. Hey, so uh, growing up, were you an athlete? Uh, no, not really. Like, uh, I, I did things recreationally, and then around, like, end of middle school beginning of high school I started playing football and I started wrestling and mostly it was just because my friends were doing it but right around the time that like coach said hey in the off season you got to start lifting weights and conditioning outside I was like you know I kind of like just doing this better and then so drop the sports and then um I definitely always prioritize being fit right but uh I was probably the strongest and fastest least athletic person you've ever met so you dug the weight room Yep. Always. Yep. So July 31st, 2011, you're doing a mud event. And yep. take me through what happened. So this was right before my senior year of college. And myself and a group of my buddies decided to do an obstacle race, which at the time was really blowing up with bigger companies like Warrior Dash and uh, Spartan Race and Tough yep. Mudder. Yep. And um one of the water obstacles for the particular race I was doing wasn't dug to the regulation that it submitted to the city. So I dove in, I hit my head on the bottom and I was instantly paralyzed from the neck down. And because there were so many people and nobody really saw me, I got ran over by all the other competitors before somebody realized I was in there and pulled me out. So you almost drowned. Yeah. Yeah. So here you are, 21 years old, your whole life's in front of you, and now you're in a hospital. What was going through your head? It's definitely one of the biggest contrasts I've had in my life. I think uh, our culture is pretty much set up now that right around 21, you've either been working for a few years or you're about to graduate university or college, and it's really, like, it's really your first true taste of independence. Um, and to be on the cusp of that and then to have the ego that's associated with being 21 and like about to, you know, do whatever you want in the world to like not even being able to scratch your own nose or be able to, you know, go to the bathroom by yourself and couldn't even sit up by myself like that. Um, it was really revealing, I guess, it's like, hey, like this, there's a whole another world out there that you don't know about. And this might be the worst possible way for you to find out about it, but you better learn really quickly. So when did you see the movie Murderball and how did that change things for you? Uh, I was still in rehab. My, my physical therapist brought in uh, the DVD and Murderball is a documentary about wheelchair rugby that came out in 2005. And for me to see other people who've gone through the same situation and be able to take control of their own life I mean, the sport itself was, um, I mean, it was fascinating to watch. It was incredibly violent. It was incredibly fast. And there was very high levels of like chemistry and teamwork and synergy. But then also see these guys like, you know, they're living their own lives. They have families, they have jobs, they have like, they have a strong sense of identity. And that identity was very independent of the fact of whether they were in a wheelchair or not. And I think that was something that I craved a lot. And to be able to see an opportunity to get that back was, was really, really pivotal for me. So from there, you've seen this sport, wheelchair. Yep. How, what was the path from there to actually playing the game and finding out that you were pretty damn good at it? It was a long path. But yeah. uh, so a lot of it was just honestly a lot of grace and a lot of luck. I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I'm originally from Michigan, but my older brother was living out in San Diego. And the plan was after I was discharged from rehab, I would come out to San Diego instead of going back to Michigan in the middle of December uh, and at least learn to take care of myself and be independent before I went back home to finish school. And while I was out here, I got connected with the rugby team out here who, you know, they used to practice down in the Balboa Municipal Park gym. Yep. And um, it was just really, really fortunate to have like they had a really strong team that was really well connected. Andy Cohn was the captain at the time and Troy McGurk, who does a bunch of CFs, like WCMX kids was the coach at the time. And uh, one of my future, well now former teammates, his wife at the time was working at CAF. So um, 
while I was there, she got me all hooked up with it. And he filled out an application to be uh, my mentor through a mentorship program CF used to run. And they actually filled out my first grant for a rugby chair for me. And, uh, you know, it was just a bunch of luck and grace. And I'm like very aware of how fortunate I am to be in those circumstances, but also like that was a hell of an introduction for me into the Challenge Athletes Foundation too, to, you know, just wake up one morning and be like, hey, your grant got submitted and processed and like you can do whatever you want in this sport now. How, how important has the sport been to you? You're, you're a guy who's comfortable with his own skin, right? You're a guy who really has grown over the last number of years. How important has been the, the sport of uh, wheelchair rugby been in that? It's been incredibly important to me, and it's definitely been a big foundation of, gosh, the past seven, eight years of my life. Yeah. Um, and, like, I almost died when I had my accident. And I think that's the case for a lot of people who go through traumatic injury. Like, I'm not unique in that. And the, the issue wasn't whether I would be paralyzed or not. The issue is whether I would survive. Yeah. I had... Uh, seven lung collapses and I had five chest tube surgeries. I was on a ventilator for two months. And, um, you know, in those moments, of course, you're going to think about your friends and your family and your loved ones. But right after that, and I mean, literally the second after that, you're going to think about the things that make you feel alive. And you're going to be think about your passions and the things you pursued, even things as boring as like, you know, just being in a weight room for, you know, a couple hours a day, and I had gone to, I had gotten a scholarship for guitar performance for college and like, you know, things like that. And, you know, unfortunately that's when I can't get back again. But then the rest of my life, there was a strong driving factor to not have any other passions, like have to like, you know, lie there and be something that I regret. And rugby definitely fills that void very much to a T and there were definitely several years that I played because I needed it. But when you have a good community and you have good mentors and you have good support and you're willing to grow and you're willing to learn, then you get this really, really great opportunity to play because you love it. And then you get a chance to help other people learn to love it too. How important was Joe Delagrave in this whole process? Uh, Joe is definitely somebody who's very, very dear to me. And he's been a phenomenal mentor and older brother and friend to me. And um, I met him during a transition period for my um, club team. And I had just gotten to the level where, you know, it looked like I was starting to do pretty good. It was looking like I could get some more opportunities outside of club ball. And I was invited to my first uh, national team trial in 2016. Uh, totally wasn't ready for it. Totally got blown out of the water. But um, my former, a former mentor who nominated me knew he was going to retire and leave the sport. And he did it as a favor for me to, you know, get my name out there, see if um, I really, like after I experienced it at that level, if I still want to put in the effort to, to, to pursue it. And that was the, and I think you talked about this on the episode with Joe, that was the same selection camp that Joe got cut from the team. And this is a guy who's been a staple, one of the best players. And captain. Yeah, captain. He's already won like MVPs in the world and, you know, yeah. best in his class in the world. And, um, you know, I clearly didn't know enough about the sport to know why, but it also gave me a really good opportunity to watch him and see what he did and to see him still show up, still put out maximum effort, uh, come back the next year, put out maximum effort, and to really put his teammates first, like, you know, like the only difference between Joe Delagrave the day before he got named a captain and the day after was somebody called him that. But ideally, you know, your integrity, your character, your effort, and the way you treat us, like that's always, that should always be the same, right? It doesn't matter if you got promoted or not. And to see someone who really acted like that gave me um, a pretty good opening to be like, hey, this is someone that, you know, like I can treat as a mentor. This is someone that I should approach for help. Like this is someone I can put aside my pride and my ego and, and learn from and, you know, not just grow as a player, but hopefully grow as like a teammate and a person too. And that's been about three or four years ago. And uh, it's, it's really, really paid off. So. 
being able to go to training camps with the U.S. team and be part of that, how, how essential is that in terms of just your, your feeling of self-worth and feeling like, you know what, my life is different, but it's, it's not all bad. It, there's a lot of good here. Yeah, it's really tough because I think – uh, to a certain degree, it's like, you know, you, you don't want to seek validation outside of yourself. But also, yeah, it's a pretty good feeling to be there. Uh, <laughs> part of the USD? Yeah. I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, like, you know, it's part of the developmental program, being able to train with the guys. And um, I think it, the biggest thing that I've learned from being there is how much value they emphasize in culture. And that, I think, is something really unique to our sport. And to see the way guys treat each other, to see the way – they put the emphasis on improving the program as a whole. Um, it, it gives you something to take home more than just, oh, I should be training this way or eating this way. Or, you know, here's another page in the playbook that I can memorize. It's, uh, it, it, it gives you something more intangible that, you know, like, you know, you can bring home to the culture of your home team. You can bring home to the culture of your workplace or your family. And ultimately you realize like, you know, it's, all, all courts and tracks and run courses are just metaphors for how you should live your life, right? You, you train, you do the appropriate amount of work, you do the appropriate amount of preparation, and then, you know, that helps you compete. But also, you know, you see a guy with a flat tire or you see someone who, who needs help, it gives you an opportunity to apply something, right? And ideally, you want to find those traits and characteristics in people and whatever they do, whether it's sports or anything. And, you know, that's part of the reason why the mission of CAF is so important is, you know, it gives you a chance to learn that in such an organic way. And it ties it so deep into your passions that uh, it really becomes ingrained into part of who you are. You're one of those guys, you're, you're a workout warrior. I <laughs> see you at CAF building doing repeats and working the weights and, yeah, you want to be on the U.S. team, but you seem like you're fitter now than you've ever been. Uh, yeah. What? Take me through like your typical day of training, because I don't think people get it. Quad rugby, when you guys are playing, you're in a 40, 45 pound chair that you have to propel. And basically it's no autopsy, yeah. no foul. You guys are beating the crap out of each other. You have to be so strong and so fit. What are you yeah. doing to get that strong and that fit? Yeah. So, I mean, that was also my way into the door, too, where, uh, like I said, I was always the strongest, fastest, least athletic person. So <laughs> my, my, my way to get noticed was like, hey, I'm just going to be as fit as possible. So if, if they can take me off of that just to get a look, then I can prove, like, the culture part and the chemistry part. And then, you know, all the other aspects of the game I can slowly work on and build up. So definitely the fitness has always been my secret ticket to – get invited to things that I shouldn't be yet. <laughs> but uh, it, it depends on where the season is. But on average, um, between like uh, strength sessions, power sessions, conditioning sessions, and then, you know, mobility and yoga and recovery, active recovery and foam rolling, like, I don't know, I'll probably spend about 20 hours a week, give or take. National athlete. Um, yeah, I mean, a normal day, usually like my first workout of the day, I don't, I don't want my hardest workout to, of the day to be the first time I'm moving. Right. So, and, and brushing my teeth doesn't count. So usually in the morning it's like aerobic capacity and stretching and, you know, something easy on the hand bike or doing, doing like cone drills at like half speed. And then, you know, go eat, take a break, come back, strength training, weight room. Um, so maximal effort work, accessory work, posterior train work. And then typically there's like a chair conditioning session too, where you, uh, working with like sprint intervals and whatnot. And um, yeah, I mean, like the chair is this awesome workout tool. Cause like, yeah, you know, it's 40, 45 pounds, but also, you know, I'm 165 pounds and I'm sitting in it. And then when the chair is not moving, you know, it's even heavier. So like you, you're motivated to keep it moving, but also takes more effort to keep it moving. But if you don't keep it moving, it gets heavier. So <laughs> it's, uh, it, it definitely took a long time to build up the, um, the needed skill set for it, but you know, it was fun. It was a really great pursuit. It was great to, you know, see changes in myself slowly over time every day. And like, I mean, I think everybody has body dysmorphia. So even your normal able-bodied person will look in the mirror and not like the way they look. And then you add on 
how I was feeling with, you know, being 21 and able-bodied and now in a wheelchair and, you know, I, you know, I don't like the way I look or whatever. And it hits your self-esteem and then, you know, to feel better about that too. And then to feel better that you're actually getting better at the sport and you're establishing habits. Like, you know, that's all, that, that's all a lot of positives tied into one. Love it. Okay. Rapid fire. Best feel. CAF memory. I'm sorry. Say that again. Oh, Best I already ruined it. CAF memory. Best CAF memory. Uh, I like the Grant Knights. We host them at the, our headquarters in San Diego, invite local athletes and, you know, these kids and athletes get a chance to meet the donors and interact with them. All right. You said rapid fire. So I'm going to stop giving these long answers. <laughs> That's a good Grant Knight. Uh, go to comfort food. Uh, Thai food. Pod see you. Most recent TV show binge. Uh, Bob's Burgers. Maybe Bob's Burgers. One yeah. of our favorites. Favorite book or podcast? Uh, Blankets by Craig Thompson or Blue Like Jazz by Donald Miller. Nice. Person you miss seeing the most during the craziness of now. And, yeah, and making that even more inclusive. What, how have you been getting through all this? Okay. Person I miss the most? Uh, my brother, probably. I mean, he lives close, but he's got two little kids. And, uh, you know, kid, kids are pretty good carriers. I'm obviously at risk as a quadriplegic. Um, I, I'm getting through this cause I'm good with routines. So I try to establish routines, stick by it. Like the more boring, the better, like, so <laughs> nice place. You can't wait to visit when this is over. Uh, I don't know, man. Just outside in general. Outside, just out of the house. Uh, yeah. Make, make the sun legal again. What words do you love to hear from a coach? You're better than last time. What words do you hate to hear from a coach? You're not better than last time. <laughs> so a message for other challenge athletes who are sitting in their homes right now, wondering you know, when this is all going to end and just trying to help them through this. Um, you know, I don't think I can say anything they don't already know, but they might have to be reminded that they already know it. Like whoever's listening, you guys have already been through some shit, man. Like you've already had to pick up your life due to things that you couldn't control and make something out of yourself. And pretty much every single one of you guys did it and did a pretty good job too. And the things that helped you get through that are the things that are going to help you get through now. But also don't be so closed minded or self-absorbed that you can't see the people next to you who might be struggling too. And the people who might not have had that opportunity to develop those skills when it comes to grace and perseverance and you know like nothing's been easy for you after your accident or if you've been congenital your whole life so it's nothing new to you but that should prove to you that you can already be great no matter what Perfect. so go be great james thank you buddy thanks Bob. always love you always make me feel like i need Probably. to go outside and go be great dude it's a pleasure all right. I've been inspired and supported by you all. Thank you. James Saad has been our guest again, Challenged Athletes Live. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Bye.